Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Well, we're glad uh, you could join us for our virtual research seminar series. My name is Camilo Ansara. I'm Associate Director of Business Development and Industry Relations at the MASH Academy, CAC School of Medicine. Uh, for those of you who are not yet familiar with the MASH Academy, our mission is to empower the convergence of research disciplines to address challenges in human health and disease. Uh, we are here as a dedicated team to help facilitate connections and collaborations across USC with the Keck School of Medicine, with other researchers, as well as externally with industry. And we're very excited to be able to bring uh, this seminar to you today. But before we start, I have a few housekeeping items that I wanted to mention. So following this presentation, we'll have a brief uh, Q&A session, which will take about uh, 20 minutes. And for the Q&A session, uh, I'd like to ask that you please use the raise your hand function on your Zoom software. Uh, when you do so, I will be able to call on you and allow you to speak. And you'll be able to address the speaker uh, directly and ask your question. If you prefer, um, you may also use the Q&A tool um, to write in a question, but we do encourage you if possible to raise your hand. We're gonna be prioritizing those questions from people who raised their hands, just because you're gonna be able to ask the question directly to the speaker and the context of the question is better understood. And finally, I wanted to let you know that this webinar is being recorded. Uh, both the slides and the recording of the presentation will be available on the MASH website within a few days. Um, and it is um, now my honor to introduce our speaker, Professor John Wilson, founding director of USC Spatial Sciences Institute, professor of sociology, civil and environmental engineering, computer sciences, architecture, and preventive medicine. Professor Wilson's presentation today is entitled Location, 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 Using the Spatial Sciences to Connect Health and Place Over the Life Course. Okay, so um, getting things started, we have a really great uh, and exciting presentation today. It is my honor to introduce our speaker. So please uh, welcome Professor Wilson. Thank you. Uh, where do I find that? What to do? Okay, so thank you. Uh, I, I want to try and do uh, uh, three major things in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. So I'm going to start by uh, motivating my comments and then I'm going to talk briefly about uh, spatial information. And uh, maybe for half my talk, I'm, I'm going to try and show you the ways that my group uh, tries to connect health and place uh, over the life course. And, you know, the overarching goal is that uh, I, I want to share with you some of the ways that we've thought about sort of building a, a place-based synthesis of the genome, the exposome and the behaviome. So the motivation. Uh, so the first thing I'd want to say is that uh, uh, people are complicated. This is a picture of the South Africans rug national rugby team playing the New Zealand national rugby team. I'm a New Zealander by birth. And the, one of the ways that people are complicated is they more often than not offer different points of view. So for me, this is a picture that shows active lifestyle, male bonding for people in the audience at this particular game, it's probably entertainment. Uh, but if there's a doctor in the audience, they may be thinking about concussion or dementia, uh, things of that nature. And, you know, having played that game a thousand times, I've seen most of those things. Uh, the next thing I'd say is that, you know, I think the complications, of course, extend to human health, whether we think of it as in terms of illness or longevity or well-being. Uh, on the left there is another picture of the New Zealand national rugby team, this time against Italy, I think. And, uh, you know, the contact, the tackle is one of the places that people worry about. And uh, there's lots of opinions about how to make the game safer. And if I think back to my childhood on the right, uh, my grandparents were both chain smokers. And, and here's a, a picture from a talk by uh, Melnick that was published in the conversation. And he's saying, mind if I smoke? And she's response is, care if I die. 
And, uh, you know, uh, it's super, super hard then to achieve uh, progress here and, and where to find place in this equation. So here there's a slide that sort of compares place and space. I think of space as a location on the Earth's surface and, and place is what gives it meaning and gives it value. Uh, and here's a website, mummydearest.com. And among the things on this website are the 10 coolest playgrounds for kids in Los Angeles. Uh, and, you know, at a certain age, this would be fun. Probably not for me at my age. Uh, but if I had grandchildren, uh, I'm sure the value would be immediate. And uh, one thing looking at the, the list here is that, uh, you know, the 10 coolest playgrounds are not evenly spread across the LA metro area. And so some places, particularly well-to-do, uh, uh, occupy most of the places on this list. And place is tricky because, you know, the same place uh, might have different meanings for different people. And I can think of no better example of, than, of that than uh, perhaps Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia, uh, where most of the statutes have something to do with the Civil War and, and the ending of slavery. And uh, that this has been a, a, a very uh, newsworthy place uh, for good reason in recent months. Now, if I switch then to the life course, uh, this is a map that's uh, recently been published by the Centers for Disease Control. And this measures uh, life expectancy at birth uh, by US census tract. You can see some black areas here. This is where there were problems with the data, so there's no published estimates. Uh, but uh, if you're in the yellow areas, uh, then your life expectancy at birth is somewhere between 81 and 97 and a half years. And if you're in the red areas, your life expectancy is somewhere between 56 and 75 uh, at birth. And you can see that, that there's a geographic pattern here. Uh, not all, but many of the red areas are in the south and the southeastern United States. And in fact, the, the the census tract with the longest life expectancy is in the state of Washington and the Pacific Northwest. But more importantly here, we all live in the same country, but between the lowest performing census tract and the highest performing census tract, uh, there's a gap of 41 years. So, uh, so the question then would be, well, why is that? And uh, Thinking of the life course, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, also point out, I think that, uh, you know, there's intergenerational effects as well. So in the graph here, we've got age uh, specific rates of major depressive disorder over 30 years and offspring of depressed or non-depressed parents. And uh, you can see that uh, the rates are much higher in those that uh, had uh, parents uh, uh, that had major depressive disorders. And so there's the possibility that the same outcomes, in this case negative, persist uh, over from one generation to the next. And, and I would just say that, of course, there's lots of great work on, on topics like this. And there has been a number of theoretical frameworks uh, that have been proposed uh, to address the intergenerational cycle of, of disadvantage. And this too is a, a, a super popular topic right now. So that's, the, that's what I want to provide as motivation. And the last piece I would say is that uh, having thought about these things for a long time, uh, my group here in spatial sciences uh, pitched the idea of an interdisciplinary PhD in population, health and place uh, a number of years ago. And in a couple of weeks, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna welcome our fifth cohort, uh, probably remotely, but nonetheless, we will welcome them. And, uh, and this is a program that's largely stood up by the Department of Sociology in Dornside, the Department of Preventive Medicine and, and Keck and, and the Social Sciences Institute. But there are many other players, both uh, research groups and research institutes, as well as schools and departments uh, across the whole university. So let me then turn my attention to uh, spatial information. You use a car navigation system, uh, you use uh, spatial information every day. If you look up uh, Google Maps, that's powered by spatial information. If you use uh, Yelp and many other websites, they're powered by uh, spatial computing as well. 
Uh, and spatial information can take any number of forms. You know, it could be about your neighborhood, could be about the difference between rural and urban areas. It could be about the indoors where I'm sitting now, or it could be about the outdoors or both. Uh, we may be focused on where we live, the neighborhood, or we might be focused on where we work or perhaps where we go for holiday. Uh, and increasingly our world is both kind of physical in the moment and virtual. And so uh, how all of these spatial footprints connect with our social networks might be important again. For some of you, I bet school districts are always on your mind and right now they're on your mind as to whether school will open again or not. Does it look promising if you're hoping for opening and it might be about parks or beaches or shopping centers. And in most modern communities, it's also about mobility, which be, might be about driving, might be about com commuting or bicycling or walking. And I, I will cover some of these topics in some of the examples I use. So the main point I wanna make here is that there's spatial data, spatial information everywhere. Uh, and so here's the, uh, some, a couple of maps from a paper by Zhang. Uh, annual mean levels of fine particulate matter pollution and that the two maps show that between 1990 and 2010 it declined quite substantially and, and, and as a consequence thousands of lives were saved. Uh, the news is not good everywhere in the world of course and so here's some work that uh, a different Zhang and I and others did about changing 2. PM 2.5 dynamics of global megacities based on long-term remotely sensed observations. So the data is coming from satellites. At one end, we have uh, cities that have uh, nearly reached uh, what the World Health Organization counts as clean air. And at the other end, uh, we have uh, cities that are nowhere near uh, to doing that. Uh, and you can see that Los Angeles is on the left side. Uh, but if we go to New Delhi on the right side, the, the PM 2.5 uh, concentrations in the atmosphere uh, might be 14 or 15 times worse than they are here. And in this case, satellite data was used both to uh, gather information about the particulate matter in the atmosphere and about uh, where in the world people lived and in these big metro areas where they we had uh, sparsely settled areas, moderately settled areas, and and densely settled areas. And so the map on the left is Beijing in 2015, and the red areas are where you have large and dense concentrations of people. And this graph here uh, takes the those areas in all 33 of these cities and looks to see uh, what their uh, long-term average annual uh, uh, pollution exposure is. Same idea here. This is a map from a paper by Annenberg, uh, study of asthma impacts caused by air pollution, uh, in this case, ozone. And these are the average ozone concentrations from 2015. We don't necessarily have to look at averages unless we want to. Uh, these data are available at a whole bunch of different temporal periodicities, and we can therefore uh, use them in any way that suits the work at hand. So the point I'm trying to make is there's lots and lots of data. And the next point I, I want to make is, uh, the next two points I want to make have to do with the fact that increasingly, uh, there's a very rich sort of series of ecosystems that sort of fuse science systems and services that a person can use to make sense of those data. And typically when I think of those systems, I'm thinking of using them as a system of record uh, for example, uh, Southern California Gas Company probably uses GIS to maintain a very detailed sort of representation of all of their facilities because in order to maintain them and provide continuous ser service, they need to know what is where, when, and how when the system breaks, they can fix it effectively and quickly. Uh, it's also a system of insight where we take, uh, informa we take data we try to turn it into actionable information, into insights and, and wisdom. Uh, and, you know, for all of us, that, that sort of part of the ecosystem is changing because we've gone from sort of classical statistics to artificial intelligence and marine and machine learning. And then increasingly, GIS is a system of engagement. Uh, your vehicle navigation system in your car, if you have one or on your, on your mobile phone, 
effectively provides a system of engagement where the interface is somebody uh, talking to you, giving you directions on how to get from an origin to a destination. And, and all of these software, of course, are increasingly powered by the cloud. And in, and in my case, there's an underlying geographic geospatial infrastructure that helps you organize uh, and anticipate how the data are organized so that you can use them uh, effectively. So there's a, in that sense, then there's a series of different kinds of themes like customers, streets, parcels, elevation, land usage, real, and, and, and they are representations, simplifications of the real world. And typically what people like me have done have divided the world into vector or raster Raster is good for data that's continuous and meaning you have values everywhere and vector uh, are things like uh, roadways because they can be represented as lines, water wells because they can be represented as points and polygons for things like parks and so forth. But that world's changing. Uh, the two pictures on the right of this slide are from a company called Pixar 4D and uh, they light our point clouds. So at the top we have a, a picture of a of a part of an urban area and a construction site. And at the bottom, uh, there's a picture of the same phenomena as seen by uh, uh, a LIDAR sensor in a, in a light plane or on a satellite. And so increasingly our representations of the world are 3D and uh, increasingly our urban worlds are 3D. And so this is super important uh, as well. So you can mix these worlds. So to illustrate that, uh, here's a picture of uh, the lower 48 states, Alaska and Hawaii are missing. Now, this was for a, a case control study I did with Miles Coburn a number of years ago. Uh, and this is UV exposure. In this case here, uh, we took uh, 1600 uh, solar radiation stations around the United States and we built an, interpolated, uh, an interpolation to gather estimates of UV everywhere in the United States. And in this case, we actually did that on a one square kilometer grid cell kind of basis. And so our first attempt at making this map was as a raster. So we had values everywhere, hundreds of thousands of values for the US. But for the case control study, the only location we knew about people's residence was by county. And so then what we did was to build uh, estimates for counties. And the whole point here, this is one of the first studies that showed that exposure to uh, lots of sunlight early in life actually was a, a good predictor of whether or not for certain ethnicities you might encounter skin cancer later in life. Because among other things here, you can see that uh, if you want to be bathed in sun at your own risk, then the southwest is the ideal location. And the northeast and, and the Pacific Northwest are not nearly so, uh, uh, the sunlight's not nearly so prevalent. And then the other kind of data you have that I'll, I'll come back to talk about the complications, but I'm guessing many of you will be interested in is of course, in the United States, we have a census every 10 years, which is data about a population. And nowadays uh, on a continuous basis, we have something called the American Community Survey. And that's a 1% sample. And uh, we have, many choices for how we bundle and share those data. Uh, but normally what we want to do is to describe the people of, a pl people of the place. So in this case, the Centers for Disease Control have calculated a social vulnerability index. In COVID-19, this would tell you the people that are most at risk from uh, running out of food, from getting ill, uh, and so on. And it uses 15 different factors, all from the census, including poverty, lack of vehicle access, crowded housing, groups them into four themes related to their socioeconomic status, their household composition, perhaps their race, ethnicity, and language, and their housing and transportation options. And, and basically, you can see if you look at LA County, that you know when you get to the coast, you've got a lot of blue, uh, so the vulnerability is low, but when you get to sort of the mid-city, uh, parts around and in downtown and then particularly in South LA all the way down to parts of San Pedro and, and the harbour and so forth, we have lots of red. Uh, and as we go to the Inland Empire out the and we see uh, snippets, snippets of red as well. And, and these data are proving uh, super popular uh, for people that are interested in sort of connecting health and place. 
And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't show you perhaps the most famous map in the world. Uh, this is a, a map inside a dashboard. Uh, but this whole enterprise here at Johns Hopkins uh, is, is, is driven on the back end by a geographic information system. Uh, and, and again, one powered by Esri, uh, not just their software, but also their data. And uh, I, I think uh, more than 6 billion people have now seen uh, this, this dashboard and the map in it uh, at least once. So that's the, that's the geographic information piece. So what I want to do next then is to talk about connecting health and place over the life course and why, why we'd want to do that and, and some of the subtleties of trying to do that. And, and the backdrop here is that, that we, we live in a world that's now awash with data. So we have data of maybe about the blue-green infrastructure. We have data, of course, about the built environment. We have both uh, visual as well as tabular data. The Google Street View there is a picture of my house in Aladina. Uh, we have data about all the businesses in the United States from companies like uh, and databases like Info USA. In this case, we have data for every business uh, from 1998, I think, to the present day. We have uh, various forms of data about the social fabric. This particular view in the middle is sort of life, life modes, lifestyle choices uh, by neighborhood for the whole of the United States in something called tapestry segmentation. And of course, the, the newcomer and super important, we have the Internet of Things uh, where data is coming to us continuously. And rather than storing and looking at later, uh, we generally have to think of how to use and how to reason with those data on the fly. So I normally do this in three ways. So one is my group might try to delineate the pathways linking place and specific health outcomes. And I'll talk briefly about that first. So since data is everywhere, one, one needs to have a sort of a conceptual model of, of what one's going to do. So in this case, uh, this is some work from uh, Daniel and his colleagues. Uh, that's clarifying, hang on, I've just got to shift something for a second. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, an attempt to describe the causal, indirect, cognitive, and direct contextual paths that link place to cardiometabolic metabolic disease. We could have picked any disease, it, it doesn't really matter, but if you look at the left here, there's some structural factors, then there's some contextual factors, uh, poverty, crime, food, social disorder, some of those from the census, some from elsewhere. You might think of those as environmental risk conditions. And then in the middle, you've got lifestyle and behavior. You've got indirect cognitive paths, direct contextual path. And, and the whole point now is how do you put all of these things together and use them to make inferences about uh, uh, potential connections between a person's lived experience and their health outcomes? Uh, and there's a few problems when you think of this. So one problem is something called the modifier weary unit problem. If you use classical statistics and you're busy working with say uh, census data and you choose the census block group, your resulting model might look different if you use census block group versus census tract. So what does that mean? Uh, it's always an open question. The uncertain geographic context problem occurs when uh, individual behaviors or outcomes are affected by the choice of spatial unit used to measure area-based attributes. M many published studies use your home address, your residential neighborhood, but many of us maybe only spend eight hours a day at home, at least pre-COVID. And, uh, and so what are the appropriate environments to understand our exposures, the opportunities we have for choosing food or whatever we're interested in. And the uncertain point observation problem occurs where the findings about the group level differences or relationships are affected by the measurement of the individual level variables via their spatial location. And so where, if you're going to me measure something about me, where would I be and what would you associate that with? And generally, these kinds of problems have to do with either the ecological or the autonomistic uh, fallacy. And there's many, many articles about this. And some of it boils down then to where should we define place? How should we define place? Many scholars think of place as synonymous with neighborhood. That's often true. And, and the choices uh, spread across thousands of paper include a census block group, a census tract, a street block. 
uh, maybe the, a person's zip code or the city they live in or the county they live in or the state they live in. And this diagram here simply is a hypothetical example of all the different shapes that might be a census block group or a census tract or a zip code uh, or the block your house is actually located in or all the blocks plus that block that touch each other. Uh, here's an example of uh, some work by Strominger and company. Uh, they were interested in looking at the relationship between the built environment and certain health outcomes. They're in Durham, North Carolina. They've got 30,000 individual parcels. They've got 57 built environment variables that are about housing condition, property disorder, territoriality, vacancy, public nuisances like garbage and so forth, uh, crime and tenancy. And they thought of four different ways to represent place as parcels, N is 30,000, as census block groups, the N is smaller, and then as primary or secondary adjacency communities, which I'll show you in the next slide. And so here on the left is the primary and the secondary uh, adjacency communities. So in the left there, the primary is your block plus the eight blocks that touch your block. In the middle, it's your block plus those eight blocks plus the next series of blocks that touch you. And then on the right, I have neighborhood planning units in, of Atlanta. In Los Angeles, in the city, often people want data by council district and in the county, they want it by service planning area. The difficulty, uh, the advantage of the right is that you're talking with people who are making decisions using the geography about which they think and implement those decisions. The disadvantage is that the data you want to drive those decisions are coming from different geographies. So in Atlanta here, we have 244 neighborhoods. We have 25 neighborhood planning units, uh, but our social, economic, much of our built environment data is coming from either 134 census tracts or 325 census block groups. And so those problems I told you about are replete in trying to use both of these different geographic frameworks. And uh, there are more problems. Uh, spatial autocorrelation is the tendency for things close together to have similar values. Spatial heterogeneity, on the other hand, is this idea that every place is unique or different. Uh, stationarity and time means that the, the statistical properties of, say, the climate or the weather, such as mean, variance, autocorrelation, are constant. But in space, it's more difficult because the spatial processes, whatever they are, would need to be both stationary and isotropic, meaning in every direction they're the same. And in this map here, we have an example of spatial autocorrelation because these are uh, median uh, property values in Massachusetts, in New England rather, or Maine, I think. And you can see that uh, the values are clustered in higher uh, along the coast uh, and, and in the interior regions, they're clustered too, but they are uh, low values. It gets trickier because uh, of the fact that people are mobile. So here's some work from Stephen Matthews at uh, Penn State. So we've got a gridded surface now for the Boston metropolitan area and over a uh, uh, a one week period, uh, he's collected data from uh, 10 families on all the different resources they have used within the metro area. And what he's done then is to locate those resources and plot where they were and count them in these squares that are 500 meters on a side. And so the, the real value of doing this is shown in this table. So we have different kinds of services, social services, work, non-food, shopping, childcare, etc. And then we've got the number of times these 10 families use those kinds of services. And then he's recorded the percentage of time the, the these families found those services in their residential census tract. This is the census tract where their house is, or the percentage of time they found it in the adjacent tract. So this is the one next door to the one they live in, or the percentage of time they found it in a non-adjacent tract. And so, in a week, there were 200, these 10 families made 222 separate trips and just about three quarters of them were somewhere else in the metropolitan area, not in or close to uh, their place of residence. And so if we're interested in exposures or we're interested in 
uh, trying to contextualize the kinds of choices they made for breakfast or lunch or dinner, or whether they would had the chance to go to the gym or not, or whether their lifestyle was active or not. All of this is super important contextual information, and it can only be got by tracing them and treating them as mobile. And the way to do that might be with something like a space-time prism. Uh, and here we have certain, we know where the trip started, we know where it ended, we know a set of stops along the way because they're using transit. And then within a 30 minute walk, we can see all the other areas they could see uh, from or visited from those stops. Now, on the one hand, these are problems, they're also opportunities because there are uh, a suite of an analytical tools nowadays that can take advantage of spatial autocorrelation, spatial heterogeneity, and so forth. And geographically regret weighted regression is one example where you know there's a relationship, say, between the amount of green space and uh, property values, say your the, the current value on Zillow for your house. But in some parts of LA, uh, lots of green space will probably give your expected house price a bump up. But in some parts of LA, uh, I've seen papers published where they show that lots of parks give your house a bump down. Uh, and the likely explanation is that in some parts of the city, parks are thought of as unsafe. Uh, this is where uh, drug, drugs are being uh, dealt and so forth. And maybe there's no on-site staff or there's not adequate lighting. Whereas in other parts of the city, uh, none of those conditions exist and the park is seen as an asset. So the, so the variables are the same, but the way in which they are related may be fundamentally different. So let's quickly then, in the time that's left, uh, go to the second way that I thought about uh, connecting health in place over the life course. And that's to delineate the risk factors to improve healthcare planning and the delivery of services. So here's, a, here's an example. Uh, in this case, so the, the general argument I would make is that space and time play integral roles in achieving better health outcomes. And the motivation would be something like this uh, picture from the Oregon Rural Practice Based Research Network. And so they're looking at uh, the impact of different factors on the risk of premature death. And you know, they, they've attributed 30% uh, uh, to genetics, 10% uh, to healthcare, 20% uh, uh, social and environmental factors. So it's a built environment, the neighborhood, where you work, your mobility choices, etc., And then 40% uh, individual behavior. And so the question becomes then, how does one build and support robust protocols to gather and link, among other things, social and environmental factors to these other suites of factors to support predictive analytics? because if the person comes to see the doctor or goes to the emergency room or goes to the clinic, the goal is, I think, that we want to leave the, want them to leave better prepared to live longer and healthier and happier lives. And so the kind of work we've been doing uh, with the uh, uh, Southern California uh, Clin Clinical and Translational Science Institute is to, from the, from the visit to the doctor or to the emergency room, uh, you know, the person uh, would share certain information about their race, ethnicity, their education, their financial resource situation, their stress, depression. So these are self-reported uh, assessments of, of themselves. Uh, and the idea now is that, well, what would happen if we could put that together, the, the individual's vital signs uh, uh, with the community level uh, vital signs? And they might be things about uh, the built environment, about environmental exposures, about neighborhood economic conditions, or the race ethnic composition of the neighborhood, or the resources, uh, or the social deprivation index. And there are many good papers that have uh, written enthusiastically about uh, how one would do that. Uh, there's a bunch of work involved uh, because uh, you have to uh, link then uh, individuals and their locations, could be their home location and or their work location until you can build an electronic health record now that not only has uh, the information that's collected, uh, you know, in the doctor's office or in the clinician's office, uh, but now the, the context in which they live their lives 
And increasingly, since there's lots and lots of data, one would want to be able to organize that information to, to, to imagine a set of outcomes. And so an example of the work we've done is we've taken uh, some, some pioneering work by my colleagues in preventive medicine, Jim Gowderman and company, and we've tried to build a simple sort of risk model around sort of neighborhood characteristics that's then added and saved with the electronic health records so that the clinicians and the doctors that see uh, patients uh, could have a better sense of, of, of what the opportunities are for helping them live longer and ha healthier lives. And so then the, the third way that I increasingly have thought about this and my group has is that uh, well, we probably need to be thinking about how to create places that support healthier and uh, healthy and meaningful lives uh, everywhere because uh, we have great disparities in the United States but if we look at the globe as a whole we have even greater disparities and uh, and and it's difficult to imagine that that we can improve uh, the, our humanity's uh, prospects without uh, thinking of lifting everybody up and so one way to think about this then is perhaps in terms of uh, rethinking uh, public space. So uh, there's a group in Barcelona that, uh, that have uh, been very, very thoughtful and, and very creative in doing this. Now, this is uh, a report on some of their work. I'll come to it momentarily. But the general idea is that we want to move from linear to single purpose to dynamic spaces with diverse uses. And so to, to do that, the, the, the ways to think about that is that we need probably more active and sustainable mobility. So cycling and walking and public zero and low emitting modes of transport. So electric cars, not gasoline cars, for example. We need increases in green and public open space. Uh, so it's about green infrastructure and biodiversity or perhaps community gardens and increasingly about age appropriate recreation spaces. You know, while I maybe spent, uh, I maybe played a thousand games of rugby in my life. Uh, uh, I did that between the ages of six and 38 and I'm not about to do that again when I'm 65. Uh, and then uh, we might think nowadays about the mitigation of climate change impacts. So perhaps less exposure to air pollution, which is still a problem in many parts of the world, but now also trying to mitigate the urban heat island. And uh, we might well think of better quality of life and social cohesion and, and more meaning to life. Um, now to give you a sense of what that's like in Los Angeles, we've actually been doing a project with the uh, mayor's office. So we've been looking at some opportunities for reimagining space uh, and therefore creating new places in central Hollywood, in the Westlake MacArthur Park area, in downtown Los Angeles, and in some parts of Chinatown. And when you think of those kinds of areas in the city, just to give you a co context here, uh, in all four of the areas we've looked at, uh, more than 90% of the people are renters rather than homeowners. Uh, about 30% of the households do not have an automobile. So that, to the best of our knowledge, then they're transit dependent. And about 30% of the surface of the earth in these four locations is taken up with transportation. In all four cases, transportation is, is by itself the largest user of the surface of the earth. Uh, both streets now and, and, and surface parking lots. Uh, although streets far, are far more important than those parking lots. And so, in, and, and so what, what, this, what our colleagues in, in Spain and other parts of the world have imagined, that the, the opportunity for rethinking public space is, is not about building parks on the periphery so that we all have to drive to them, because LA actually has a, a very nice collection of parks around the periphery, but it's about creating new spaces within the middle of the city. And, you know, the baseline situation here is roads that are all one way going in alter alternating directions from one street to the next. And uh, the map on the right uh, is where we've, we've carefully controlled the, the direction of flow on these roads so that uh, we've reduced the number of cross, cross study area trips in hopes that we could recover 
and, and use some of this uh, real estate uh, for multiple uses. Uh, and, and, and I think this is going to be very, very important going forward. And Barcelona in particular uh, has a very ambitious plan to, to make about 900 of these so-called super blocks. Uh, when uh, Natalie Mueller and her colleagues published this paper, there were just two such super blocks. Uh, and the other novel aspect of their work is, of course, that they are busy trying to measure uh, that the health-related impacts of making these kinds of urban transformations. Uh, I think the opportunities here are huge. And so here, I'm sorry, I forgot to put a separate list of the uh, 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, but the point of this particular graphic uh, from, from uh, Ramirez Rubio's paper is to demonstrate that there's a connection between just about every single one of these uh, Sustainable Development Goals uh, in health, and that uh, perhaps we would, we would gather better traction if we were to think in, in everything we do about uh, uh, humanity's health and how, how we can create more sustainable, more resilient, healthier and happier communities, not just here in Los Angeles, uh, not, not just in the United States, but probably the world over. So that's the third way in which I've thought about these connections. And it's a much more proactive way because rather than report on what's wrong with the world, we are here trying to imagine how to make a better world. And for my institute, that's largely what we focus on each and every day. And the argument I've tried to make today here is that place provides a, probably a relatively new and potentially valuable way to connect the different facets of uh, human well-being and that it provides numerous opportunities for us to advance improvements in human well-being, both here and everywhere on the planet. Uh, and it might be a special time because cities now drive much of what happens on the planet. There's a C40 uh, collection of cities. It was once 40 cities. I think now it's about 140. But at, at this moment, uh, uh, the mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti, is the chair of this whole organization. And, uh, and, and I would guess that that has something to do with his Green Plan LA, his Resilient Plan LA, and, and he, he would be, he is, and, and I think in the future will be a welcome partner in us trying to reimagine uh, our city. So with that, I, I'm happy to stop and take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Wilson. Um, so now, now we're gonna like to uh, open up to questions. So if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and use the raise your hand function. Uh, and I'll be able to let you speak and we can, uh, you can address the, the speakers directly. So um, we have a question from Anna Wu. Uh, you can go ahead, um, if you could please uh, unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and ask the question. Anna, we, we can't we can't hear you. You you do have to unmute yourself. We can't do that for you. Uh, okay, so we will uh, move over to the next uh, question. Uh, Elizabeth Solo, uh, can you please um, go ahead and? Unmute yourself and, and go, yeah, go ahead and speak. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I was just curious if you know of any mapping efforts to look at um, lead in water based on age of, uh, you know, the, the, the plumbing. We've, we've looked at it in a, a large cohort of nine and 10 year olds, uh, 10,000 of them. We've looked at the risk of exposure on brain and cognitive development based on age of housing, primarily considering lead paint. But I'm wondering if you know of any efforts to try to sort of map the age of plumbing. Does that make sense? 
Yep, yep. So, you, I mean, uh, I mean, there's two parts to be worried about, right? So traditionally what happens in the United States is the, the local water company uh, provides the pipes uh, to the edge of the property and then the homeowner is responsible for the pipes bringing water in and taking uh, wastewater out from the property line to the house and inside the house. So uh, if, if it was the wastewater company, uh, I, I presume that they have pretty detailed maps, databases now that describe their infrastructure, which would have probably, in, among other things, described the kinds of pipes they had. So that's one thing you could use to infer what the conditions were, because you'd probably know the kind of pipe and its age on that, in that case. And on, on the other side, for the part of the pipes that's, that's on individual properties, I'm, I'm guessing that, that, that you would simply need to use the age of the house to make some inferences about the likelihood uh, that they had certain kinds of pipes. So then obviously the problem is it's very expensive and people from lower income families or who rent in older buildings um, would have difficulty of affording that. Oh, certainly true. So, so, <laughs> you know, with, with my comments, what I was trying to this, what I was trying to, you know, my three sort of thrust, one was describing what the problem was. And, and it was in the last one that I tried to describe, you know, how we could address some of these problems. But, you know, these inequities are long standing, of course, and they are super, super hard to, to uh, to respond to. And so I think the first thing is to identify who's at risk and, and to what extent they're at risk. And then, you know, I think as a society, we need to, we need to come to grips with uh, uh, what we can do that's progressive and proactive in, in trying to enable people to, to, to find the resources needed to do these things. And I, I don't know if you would even know, and I don't need to monopolize anything, but the, the concept, a, a, a postdoc in my lab, Andrew Marshall, um, called like every state in the county for health records related to blood lead levels to try to map it to the risk maps. And there's a lot of places that either don't have or won't share information on lead levels of kids tested. And I, I just have this weird theory that they don't want us to know because then they would have to pay for it. I don't know. That's just my conspiracy theory. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I can't help you in, in understanding whether that's a, an appropriate theory. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, you know, sometimes, uh, my experience sometimes is how you, it's about how you ask for data. Sometimes yeah. the, the, the agencies that hold the data, their big fear is that it's going to cost them money to, to respond positively to your request. And yeah. so um, I've had success where I could describe uh, in advance uh, what kind, not just what kinds of data I'm looking for, but all the different ways I'd be willing to receive it, right? Huh. Uh, so I could receive it in a CSV file. I could receive it in a... In a uh, an Esri shape file, I could receive it uh, as a Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and if, if they already have one of those things, then they, they may still not want to share the data. But sometimes once they realize that there's no big effort on their part required, maybe they, they'd be more, uh, more willing to, to, to share it and be helpful in that sense. Well, thank you so much for your thoughts on this. And I would love to uh, maybe talk to you um, at at some point in the future. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, we have uh, another question from um, Keshin Yu. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, please unmute yourself um, and go ahead and ask uh, the question directly. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Quite. All right. Uh, Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I am a PhD candidate at School of Social Work. And for my dissertation, I'm looking at how's the environment affecting social isolation and cognitive decline among older adults and in disadvantaged areas. Um, I find a quite interesting 
uh, phenomena, which is um, older adults with lower income are more likely um, to be isolated, no matter how, what is the social cohesion situation in the community. Um, so I guess I have been grappled with the idea of how to change the situation, because I kind of see a lot of evidence has been built on the disparity issues, but how to kind of change the environment, especially those communities with less resources, I just find it really difficult. And I want to ask you, um, have you seen any real case, real world case, or in your research, how to address those issues in more disadvantages, disadvantaged areas? Uh, well, these are super important questions. Uh, you know, I, uh, I know this is not a very satisfactory answer, but my first answer would be that universities by themselves are not particularly well equipped to, to do the kind of advocacy and sort of place changing works that you're talking about. But and so where I've where, in places where I've seen universities contribute, it's normally that they seek out and find partners uh, and they, they complement one another such that the sum of the parts is more than the parts. Right. So, uh, you know, I think I think universities are best positioned to provide insight and inference that that show what what pro are the probable factors that lead to these outcomes. And, you know, potentially there's the opportunity to construct either uh, case control or cohort studies or natural experiments in which we can maybe inf demonstrate or infer that if we did it, if we were able to do this, then the situation could be changed for the better uh, in order to inform then uh, both different public and public agencies and non nonprofits uh, how they might uh, intervene to, to affect change uh, that leads along the lines that they, that of the kind of change they're trying to accomplish. But, you know, I, the difficulty is that uh, there are many, many disadvantages that that lead that 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 people uh, in disadvantaged areas experience and so uh, and and you know it's a whole ecosystem and so it, it's hard to imagine how we how we could just modify one thing and affect uh, sustained and, and measurable positive change uh, and this is a big societal issue of course about the distribution of wealth and and how we choose to organize uh, so on and so forth. Thank you for the insight. I, I, I know that there's no a simple answer to the whole issue, but I think that makes sense to um, do what we can do, start what, with what we can do at universities. Well, let, let, um, go, go ahead, Dr. Wilson. Let, let, let me say one other thing, you know, with uh, a, another group of scholars, Carla de la Haye and Wandi Bruin de Bruin and some others, we, we've been looking at uh, across COVID-19 at, at food insecurity across LA County. Uh, and so, you know, it's a very fast moving, serious and dynamic problem. And, uh, you know, there are many, there are many drivers uh, for how people become food insecure. Uh, some has to do with their income, some has to do with uh, kind of the character and strength of their social network, uh, some has to do with uh, their mobility, and some has to do perhaps with the neighborhood they've lived in and, and what's been the kind of tra the trajectory or plight of that neighborhood uh, from, from say the beginning of March through to now. Uh, because in some parts of the city, if there's a particular market that closes, you know, if there's five others, maybe you lost your favorite market, but there are plenty of choices and the opportunity cost of picking another one is, is relatively small. But I could imagine there are some other parts of the city where there was just one market. And if for whatever reason it closed, maybe there was an elderly couple that owned and ran it and they got COVID, uh, then, uh, you know, suddenly your food choices are an extra, you know, mile or so away. 
uh, and if you're already, you know, you're already caught because you've got little or no income and, and, and you don't have a vehicle, then transit is hard. And so, uh, you know, these are, these are things that uh, we, we need to be better equipped to both anticipate and model and describe. And, and, and then we need to seek out partners with, with whom we can work to, uh, to address some of these super serious uh, constraints and challenges that people face, both in extraordinary as, as well as uh, perhaps more ordinary times. Thank you so much. Thank you. We do have uh, two questions, one in the raise your hand uh, panel from Victoria Mezak. And we also have a question from Linda Brookman on the Q&A um, section. If, Linda, if you'd like to uh, speak up and, and ask the question, please raise your hand. I will call, call you um, after um, Victoria's question is answered. So Victoria, um, please go ahead and unmute yourself and um, feel free to ask the question directly to uh, Professor Wilson. Hello, can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Okay, uh, hi, Dr. Wilson. So I am currently a public health student in the, in the master's program and I, I wanna pursue the geo health track. Yes. My, more of what my concern is as of right now is you know, when we get sent practicum opportunities and like prepping for now with COVID and everything, like what practicum you know, sites we have access to, I just, I wanted more information as to like, if there's anything that you specifically offer or like what specific agencies or organizations I should be looking for because I you know geo health was something it seems like it is something a little newer to the public health track as well yes. and so I'm more of like eager to like find more information out about what I can do as a public health student within this realm well if you want to do something really aspirational you could uh one thing you might learn in that track is, is how to think about building dashboards that mirror uh, the kind of dashboard that Johns Hopkins University has built for COVID because, you know, we need one of those for diabetes. We need one of those for any number of ailments that affect people so that, you know, we can, you know, understanding and motivating ourselves to solve problems typically first requires us to understand, well, what's the extent of the problem? Uh, but, uh, you know, I think uh, what I see today is that, you know, most uh, county health departments uh, have big GIS kinds of groups and they use mapping as part of their everyday practice, um, more or less continuously and ordinary as well as COVID-19 times. Uh, in Children's Hospital LA, there's, there's, there's lots of examples of people that use mapping for their work and various nonprofits, uh, both local and international. There's an increasing use of GIS and sort of data analysis to inform what they do. Uh, organizations like Doctors Without Borders, uh, Operation Smile, the, I think it's called the International Medical Group. And so, you know, like you're in a, a Masters of Public Health and it has a number of tracks, we have a number of master's degrees of our own and we've been pleasantly surprised at the number of health organizations our GIS students have been able to connect with and, and engage in meaningful work together. So uh, it, you, you could contact us uh, offline and, and we could give you some probably good pointers for where you would look for those opportunities. Uh, but they are growing substantially and quite quickly. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, we have um, one uh, last question from uh, Linda Brookman. Um, the question is, have you worked with the NIH Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research, OBSSR, working collaboratively with other universities? Uh, so no, I haven't. So maybe rather than just say no, uh, I am an active member and uh, the co-director of a bunch of the initiatives within the Southern California Environmental Health Sciences Center. So that's funded by the, uh, the Environmental Health Sciences uh, uh, part of NIH. And uh, I am and have been for a long time actively engaged with uh, uh, the population health group within the National Cancer Institute. And I, I am a, a, a member of the uh, faculty member for the uh, CTSI 
uh, enterprise on campus and at Children's Hospital LA. And, but I do see in our future that our work is growing quickly into these sort of behavioral science areas. And I, and I anticipate that there will be connections uh, in, in the future. Um, thank you. Does anyone else have um, any questions uh, for our speaker? We have a question from Vasiliki Anist. Uh, Vas, please uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. And Thanks, Camillo. Hi, Dr. Wilson. Thanks so Hi. much for this amazing presentation. So much to think about. Um, I'm with the Mesh Academy and we, we met a while back. Yep. Not at the, obviously at the science level here, but maybe it's a, also a question and comment we can follow up and maybe in a potential another seminar. But what I'm interested to better understand is, um, you know, what are the approaches or challenges that you need to overcome for data quality and confidentiality and protection of that data? I'd like to understand more about that. And especially what I'm seeing here during the pandemic, which obviously started beforehand with the kind of like, you know, eroding of that public trust and support from the public. I would just kind of like to, you know, see if you can touch on that. I know it's a big question, a little bit loaded. Um, but I just want to understand um, more about the data quality coming in and how do you, um, what are the approaches for that? And then how do you look at confidentiality and protection of that data? Right. So, the, I mean, these are super important questions, obviously. And so, uh, you know, it's very, it's, uh, I, I would say it's getting harder. I mean, the reason why for particularly wealthy and important men were be sitting before Congress yesterday were to, to address how their companies were dealing with these issues. And you know, I think it's fair to say that Congress probably wasn't happy with all their answers and most of the US population would not be happy with all their answers either because you know, I, I can say in our own work that sometimes if we know two or three things about a person, we can pretty reliably guess what street block they live on, right? And so uh, it's uh, very tricky and, and it's very tricky to use something like the American Community Survey uh, where you're looking at say race, ethnicity uh, because, you know, you might have, uh, you know, you have a 1% sample. And so if you have, you know, a, a particular uh, census block group that's got a small number of one particular race ethnicity group, then you're not going to get a reliable count of, of, of how many of those individuals live in that particular geographic area. Uh, and so there are some statistical ways to manage that. But but, but so there's, uh, there's sort of problems with when you don't know something and you, you, you build inferences that are in fact incorrect. That's not going to be helpful uh, for the people of the place. Uh, but then the flip side, which I think you're asking about, is that, well, what, if, what do I do to protect identities? And, and it's a big topic in my field. And so sometimes when people think of making maps, they think of, of making them fuzzy by introducing random error so that somebody can't see the pattern and make the kinds of inferences that would lead to identifying individuals. But I would say with COVID-19 that probably the whole landscape has changed because in order to have con contact tracing, uh, you know, basically uh, whether we like it or not with our cell phones, they're always uh, pinging messages backwards and forwards to the cell towers and there's a way to collect that data anonymously, right? And, you know, we just, uh, from a company called SafeGraph, we got uh, cell phone pings for the last, I don't know, eight or nine months uh, for 10% of the US population. And so we, we can tell you based on our preliminary analysis that in different parts of the city of LA and in different parts of the county, and then in different counties in California, we have very different mobility patterns because from these cell phone things, we can tell who stayed at home all day. We can tell probably who went to work, where they went to work. We can tell uh, quite a lot about people in their lives, right? And my guess is that when COVID is, as I hope, we get to the end and we're in a better place, I don't think that functionality is going to go away. And the idea that they share that functionality is going to go away because 
obviously it has huge benefits to to uh, commerce, right? To to okay. to retail and so forth. So there's lots of things that are going to find these kinds of data to useful, and and then there's all the data that's collected already by by consent or by people just not realizing what's happening through all of these different senses and so forth that, that we now use for very good reasons, but that are connected continuously to the web and therefore capable of being collected and, and used in, 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 as part of the internet of things. So these are super, super serious questions and uh, they probably deserve uh, quite a bit more of our attention. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, uh, Elizabeth has a follow-up question. Um, Professor Wilson, do you have a few more minutes? Yep. yep. Uh, Elizabeth, please, um, we ask that you be brief so we can uh, uh, end uh, the, the session as soon as uh, your question is answered. So please go ahead and ask the question. Yeah, it, it was more of a comment that we, <clears throat> my group is getting, or we've submitted a, a COVID supplement to get safe craft data and match it to the 10,000 kids from the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study. And we've started already um, sending out questionnaires to ask kids and families their, their experience, you know, health, mental health, um, uh, practices with, with safety. And we're trying to match it with the geocoded sort of neighborhood factors so uh, yep. it's really exciting potential yeah so uh so where do these ten thousand people live all across the united states they do yep so you potentially you've got many thousand neighborhoods to worry about yep yep so you've already you've already harvested and organized those data to do that yes but we have not yet integrated data from safecraft all right so <clears throat> So of course, the thing you have to worry about is what what kind of geographic unit you're going to get the data from SafeGraph or anybody else for. And I think so, it's census tract. Okay, so we which is what we have for the rest of the yep. cohort. Yeah, we've been talk. We've my group's been talking to them about uh, could we have census block group uh, data. Uh, okay. So there's about five, on average, typically there's sort of five to seven census block groups in each census tract across the United States. Uh -huh. uh, but you, you'll get a long way with the census tract data. And the, the thing you need to think about is what kind of, of metrics do you build from the data that they fit, they give you? Uh, because it's a very large and, you know, wandering sort of data set in our uh -huh. experience. And, and we, we have a first draft of a paper in which we've tried to understand, well, what actually, how do we build a set of metrics that we can interpret and understand about people's mobility based on, on the okay. raw data that we got from SafeGraph? Well, I, again, I would love to talk to you because this is all so exciting and uh, just really, really, really important stuff you're doing. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're glad everyone had the chance to ask uh, their questions. So I'd like to thank especially Professor Wilson for a fascinating presentation. Very interesting. So thank you for taking the time uh, to speak to us today. We really appreciate it. Um, our next seminar will be on August 13th. And you have uh, uh, here up on the screen. And uh, we hope that you all be able to join us then. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. And goodbye. Thank you.